Good morning, everyone. I mean, thank you so much for being here. Um, this screen isn't on yet. I'll start, tell, I, I'll start telling stories while we're waiting. <laughs> so this morning, I'm going to be talking about keto and paleo diets. And I can remember first um, becoming really aware of these diets probably about 10 years ago, especially the paleo diet about 10 years ago, because at the gym I was going to, it was the diet everybody was on. I think every single uh, fitness instructor at the gym was doing paleo. And uh, I can also remember when keto started to gain some uh, favor in the, you know, just we saw more and more people switching to, to keto. And I, I see people at the gym all the time on the keto diet. And, and I can also remember one of my very favorite instructors, uh, probably about five years after he started paleo, switching to a more plant-based diet. And he told me that the reason he was making the switch was because so many of his colleagues had uh, several of, of the most well-known leaders in the fitness world had developed cancer. And I thought that was so interesting. And so he said, and they shared this book that they're starting to use, and it was called How Not to Die. <laughs> of course, I got a big smile on my face. I thought, isn't that interesting? So they were starting to understand that there was a connection between what they were eating and the risk of these chronic diseases. So I thought to myself, it concerned me to see so many people moving in the direction of a more meat-heavy diet, uh, especially in the early days of paleo. And so I thought I need to learn more about this and find out um, enough to be able to talk with, with, uh, with some authority on the subject. And so that's why I'm going to be talking about that today. And so I'm going to just give you a little bit of an outline. Uh, so the first thing we're going to talk about is a little bit about the history of low carbohydrate diets. So we're talking about keto and paleo, which are kind of the two extremes of low carbohydrate diets. So we'll talk a little bit about the history. Then I will define keto and paleo diets, talk a little bit about the similarities and the differences between these types of diets. Then we'll dig a little deeper into some of the claims that are made by both camps, the keto and paleo camps. And then we'll compare a little bit about plant-based versus low-carb diets and how people do long-term on these diets. And we'll finish off, uh, finish off talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly of uh, low-carbohydrate diets. So a little bit about the history, and this is just a couple of slides, I think maybe three slides that goes through uh, the time, sort of timeline of, of the beginnings of, of these diets. And, and so ketogenic diets, were st we started using them in the 1800s to treat type 1 diabetes. And this made a lot of sense because at that time, of course, there was no insulin. So diabetes was a death sentence in fairly short order. And so a ketogenic diet would provide an alternative fuel for people that couldn't use sugar. And then in 1921, ketogenic diets began to be used to treat epilepsy. And, and the way that happened was there was some evidence that fasting could help reduce epileptic seizures. And of course, fasting causes ketosis. And, and so, because you start to use your body stores and you produce this other uh, energy source. And so the thinking was, well, we can't obviously starve these little kids who, who have epilepsy, but could there be another way of producing ketosis? to reduce epilepsy. And so that's how they started using these diets back in 1921. And then in 1958, we started to see interest in using ketogenic diets for weight loss. And there was a book that came out, or not ketogenic here, it was just a low carb diet for weight loss. And this was a, 
um, uh, a weight loss book back in 1958. And then the reason I put this one on is I just thought it was really funny. It's a low carbohydrate, up to 60 grams of carbohydrate, which is like two apples a day, that's it. That's all the carbs you'd be allowed. Uh, and daily alcohol. So it was called the drinking man's diet. And I don't know, it's kind of funny. And then in 1967, many of you may remember this, I sure do, but it was the Stillman diet, another low carb diet. And then in 72, really, we, ha we had the release of the book that launched the low carb craze. And that was uh, the Dr. Atkins diet revolution. And everybody knows about Dr. Atkins. And then in 1975, the first kind of paleo style diet appeared and it was called the Stone Age diet. And, and then in 78, the Scarsdale diet, another low carb diet. And then in 92, Atkins revised his stuff a little with the Dr. Atkins new diet revolution. And then in 2002, the sort of king of paleo, Dr. Lauren Cordain, put out his uh, book called The Paleo Diet. And that made paleo quite popular. And then in 2003, the South Beach, and then all of the books and articles by Gary Tobbs. And then in 2013, the paleo diet actually reached number one in, the Google, in Google search as the most popular diet. And then in 2018, keto diets actually snatched the crown and uh, became number one in the uh, search for the most popular diet. So they're the reigning king. So what is a ketogenic diet? Well, it's basically a diet that forces your body to shift away from using glucose as the primary fuel to using more ketones. And so why does the body shift? Well, number one, could be starvation, fasting, or very severe food restriction. So you're eating either nothing or maybe six or 800 calories a day, and your body needs to find some other form of fuel. So it relies on ketones. And the second thing that can cause the shift is a diet that's mostly fat. So you're not getting enough carbohydrates to fuel your body. So your body has to shift over to using something else. And so it starts to use ketones. So what are ketones? Well, ketones are the acids that are produced by the liver from fatty acids. So instead of using carbohydrate, you're using fat. And when you use fat, we first of all, we constantly produce ketones. Everybody produces ketones. They're in our bodies all the time, but in very tiny amounts. We use it as a, as a small bit of our total fuel. When you're deprived of glucose, however, ketone, your body's ketone production just ramps up and you reach a metabolic state called ketosis, meaning that you're using a lot of ketones. So does ketosis equal ketoacidosis? Many people get the two confused. And in fact, in ketosis, the amount of ketones in your blood is higher than normal, but it's not high enough to cause acidosis. In ketoacidosis, and remember, ketones are acidic, okay? So they're acidic. When in ketoacidosis, the ketones go so high that it causes your blood levels of, of acids, of ketone, as, acidic ketones, to be so high that it's dangerous to your life. And in fact, people who develop ketoacidosis, about two to 5% actually die. So, and it's most common in, in type one diabetics who don't give themselves their insulin injections, okay? And so that, your body levels of ketones just go through the roof. But we've also seen, interestingly, some case studies of women who are lactating, so they're breastfeeding, so their energy needs are really high. They go on a super low carb or ketogenic diet and actually go into ketoacidosis. So it's, it, that can happen as well. That's more rare. Most ketoacidosis is, is in people who have type 1 diabetes. So is ketosis, now we know ketoacidosis is not safe,
but is ketosis safe? Well, it's generally thought to be relatively safe in the short term, but I think it can have some fairly negative consequences in the long term, and we'll talk later about some of those. But just as an example, think about your body being acidic for a, an extended period of time, your body has to buffer the acid. And of course, we have, we have this amazing storehouse of buffer called our skeleton. And so we use the calcium from our skeleton as a buffer for the acid. So long term, it could actually injure our, our uh, bones. So how long does it take for the body to shift from using glucose to using ketones? Well, it usually takes about one to three days of not eating, like fasting, or eating a very low carbohydrate diet. First, what happens is we use up our stores of sugar, which are called glycogen. Then once our glycogen stores are, are gone, we make glucose via a process called gluconeogenesis. So genesis is the generation, neo is new, and then gluco for glucose. So creating new glucose. And we, what do we use to create glucose? Well, when we break down fatty acids in triglyceride form, part of that molecule is a glycerol backbone, which we can use to make glucose. We can use lactate, which is a byproduct of glucose metabolism, to make glucose. We can even use certain amino acids to make glucose. So we have a number of things we can use to do this process of gluconeogenesis. And then as glucose reserves are depleted, the body just ramps up the ketone production as well. So can all our cells, and this is really important, can all the cells in the body use ketones? The answer is absolutely not. So up to 50% of our basal energy needs and up to 70% of our brain energy needs can be supplied by ketones. However, the balance will ha still have to come from glucose. Now, the other thing to know is that, there, that cells need two things to be able to use ketones. They need mitochondria, and they need certain enzymes for the process of producing ketones. Some cells actually don't have them. And one of the cells that doesn't have, one of the types of cells that, that doesn't have them is red blood cells. Red blood cells actually lack mitochondria. They must have glucose or they will not survive. That's their energy source. And the other is surprisingly, our liver cells lack the necessary enzymes for the conversion. So liver cells can't use uh, ketones for energy either. Those cells absolutely must have glucose. So are there any physiological benefits to ketosis? Well, in fact, there are, and, and particularly, we have a number of studies looking at using fasting or modified fasting, such as the fasting mimicking diet, and they've reported uh, fairly favorable effects, like reduced blood pressure, cholesterol, blood glucose levels. Well, of course, when you're not eating, you get those, those kinds of, of results. But this is the one that I think is most interesting. When you're fasting, your body's trying to survive. So it gets rid of deranged cells, cells that aren't working properly, that could be cancerous even. It just tries to get rid of those cells. And something happens that your, your stem cells actually get boosted and new growth of new cells start to, starts to occur, which can be very, very uh, healing in some cases. So uh, that's important. Of course, you get weight loss and you get reduced visceral fat and you get lower uh, IGF-1 levels as well, which as you know, can cause the growth of sometimes unwanted cells. And, and so these are, you know, we also get reduced inflammation. And so you've, you've heard, if, if you've heard about uh, True North, for example, and some of these places that use fasting therapeutically, they have really quite wonderful success. So there may be benefits in, in those regards. But our focus today is going to be on high fat, low carbohydrate diets. And the, these diets, and, and they're producing uh, ketosis 
and is that good or bad and why or why not? So the keto diet has really become uh, just wildly popular as a weight loss diet and, and it's gaining ground as a diet that could be used therapeutically to treat disease. So we're gonna address those. So let's look now at, at the macronutrients in a keto diet. This is a keto weight loss diet. So it's generally about 75% of calories from fat, about 20% protein, and about 5% uh, carbohydrate or less. So you can see it's very, very low in carbohydrates. And we see a range, so, you know, it can go up to 80% of calories from fat and a little less in protein. But what really sticks, no matter what, is it is not more than 5% of calories from carbohydrates. Now, this is the classic ketogenic diet that was used for epilepsy and still is used for epilepsy. It's 90% fat, only 6 to 8% protein, and only 2 to 4% carbohydrate. Okay, so this is a diet that is extremely high in fat and low in both protein and carbohydrate. So it's stricter than the ketogenic weight loss diet. It would produce more ketones than what, what the weight loss diet would. So what foods are actually permitted on this diet? Well, you can see the base of the pyramid is meat, poultry, and fish, then eggs and dairy, then fats and oils, and then green vegetables and some non-green, non-starchy vegetables. And then at the top, you've got a few nuts and seeds and berries. What's not allowed, as you can see, is all the high carbohydrate foods like bread and pasta and sugar and, and fluid milk. I mean, we do allow some, they do allow dairy, but it's the high fat dairy like cheese and, and cream and butter. And uh, no corn or beans or rice or any of the non or of the, any of the starchy vegetables either. And the basic, you know, theme would be eat fat, eat meat, poultry, eggs, and fish. The fattier, the better. And eat non-starchy vegetables. So that's kind of the the diet in in a sentence. Here's a sample recipe to give you a flavor. I got this from one of the popular keto websites. And you can see here, this recipe has three pounds of ground, fatty ground beef, two cups of pepper jack cheese, four cups of Colby and Monterey cheese, jack cheese, and then two cups of frozen uh, pepper strips. And that's, that's, that's it. So an eighth of the recipe has almost 800 calories, 61 grams of fat, or about 70% of calories from fat, 30 grams of saturated fat, seven grams of cholesterol, of, of uh, carbohydrate, 49 grams of protein, 250 millig 205 milligrams of cholesterol, and less than half of a gram of fiber. So there's almost no fiber there at all. So let's look at the paleo diet and how it compares to this. So the paleo diet is essentially a pattern of eating that attempts to mimic the diet of our Paleolithic ancestors. Other names you see are caveman diet, Stone Age diet, primal diet. And the basic premise is that what humans ate in pre-agricultural times is the diet best suited to our genetic makeup. The shift from a hunting, gathering diet, rich in wild meat and wild plants, to an agricultural diet, rich in grains and legumes, gave rise to our obesity and chronic disease epidemics. So, so that's what's believed in the paleo world. So what do the paleo macronutrients look like? Well, it's about 50% fat, about 30% protein, and about 20% carbohydrate. So it's a low carbohydrate diet, but not nearly as low as the ketogenic diet. So what foods are permitted? Well, you can see it looks really similar to the keto diet pyramid. Here's meat at the bottom, then fruits and vegetables in the middle, and then nuts and berries at the top. And of course, there's no beans, there's no, there's no um, uh, grains, there's no, one of the differences, of course, there's no uh, dairy here as well. And here's a sample recipe, it's very similar. Half the recipe is 643 calories, 
37 grams of fat, 54 of protein, so it's even higher in protein, but it's got more carbohydrate, about 24 grams, 147 milligrams of cholesterol, and it's got more fiber, about eight grams. So let's compare the paleo and the keto diets. So the similarities are in blue, the differences are in pink here. So let's look at the similarities first. Meat, poultry, fish, and eggs are high in both of these diets. Uh, nuts and seeds are included in both diets. Green vegetables are included in both diets. Legumes are excluded in both diets. Grains are excluded in both diets. Okay, so here's the differences. So in the paleo diet, there is no dairy, whereas in the keto diet, there's quite a bit of dairy, mostly cheese and very high fat dairy products. Uh, other non starchy vegetables um, are included in the paleo diet pretty generously, and they're included but limited in the keto diet, which I'll show you in a minute. Starchy vegetables are limited in uh, paleo and they're excluded in keto. There is no, there are no potatoes or squash or any of those kinds of vegetables in a keto diet, but in a paleo diet, they, they'll fit in a sweet potato here or there, something like that. And then fruits are moderate in the paleo diet and they're minimized in a keto diet because they have a lot of carbohydrates. And then uh, concentrated fats and oils are fairly moderate in a paleo diet and they are extremely high in a keto diet. So again, the macronutrients in keto, about 75% fat, 20% protein, 5% carbohydrate, whereas paleo is 50% fat, 30 protein, 20 carbohydrate. So let's talk a little bit about the carbohydrate restriction and what we're really talking about here. So a keto diet is less than 5% of calories from carbohydrate. Other low carb diets are about six to 20% of calories from carbohydrates. So paleo is actually at the highest end of low carb diets, whereas keto is at the lowest end of the range of low carb diets. So how many grams of carbohydrates are we talking about? Well, keto diets are 20 grams for most keto diets. Some will go as high as 30 grams, but it's usually they try to keep the lid at 20 grams. So they try to eat less than 20 grams of carbohydrate. Whereas for paleo, it's about 100 grams. So it's much more generous. So let's take a look at the percentage of calories from carbohydrates in plant foods. So fruits are about 92%, starchy vegetables about 90, uh, legumes about 70, non-starchy vegetables about 60, 58 or so, and nuts and seeds are about 12. Okay, so, so think about these numbers, and then remember, a keto diet is less than 5% of calories from carbohydrates, and a paleo about 20. Well, the vast majority of plant foods range from about 60 to about 90% of calories from carbohydrates. How many of those foods can they afford to eat if they're trying to get less than 5% or even less than 20% of calories from carbohydrates? Not a whole heck of a lot. So we really need to understand that plant foods are predominantly carbohydrates with one exception, and that exception is nuts and seeds. That's where we get our essential fats from, okay? And, and otherwise, they are predominantly carbohydrate. So how much carbohydrate in non-starchy vegetables? So a lot of people say, oh, keto diets, we can have lots of non-starchy vegetables. But if you look at it, an avocado has 12 grams of carbohydrate. If you're only allowed 12, 20 grams of carbohydrate for the day, how many avocados can you have? Maybe one. Um, turnips, 12 for a cup. Brussels sprouts, 11 for a cup. Um, and, and then we've got sort of the medium uh, uh, non-starchy vegetables like eggplant, cabbage, carrots, asparagus, broccoli, peppers, with somewhere between six and nine. And then the lower um, uh, carb vegetables, like the leafy greens, which might only have one gram of carbohydrate per cup. So you could eat more of, of those, but you certainly couldn't eat a lot of the other 
uh, non-starchy vegetables, just so you know that there really is a limit on how much they can consume. Now, if you look at the carbohydrate content of other foods, and remember the lid is 20 grams for a keto diet, um, you know, take a look at uh, any of the grains or, or starchy vegetables. A serving of a cup of granola is 66 grams of carbohydrate. A bagel is 56. A cup of beans is 40. Uh, one apple is 30. The limit for keto diet is 20. These people, honestly, I heard somebody at the gym the other day say, I just realized how bad apples are for me. You know, can you imagine? And, and so this is the thinking that these foods are bad because there's this black and white thinking. If a food contains carbohydrates, it's bad. <laughs> you know, if it doesn't, it's good. So that's the thinking. So what are they eating? Well, they're eating a lot of this stuff down at the bottom of this of this chart here. They're, they're eating cream cheese, sour cream cheese, butter, meat, chicken, fish, eggs. Those are the things that don't have carbohydrate. So by definition, this diet is a diet of this stuff. Okay, so just, just so you get that. So which is more healthful, a keto diet or a paleo diet? Well, a paleo diet is definitely healthier than a keto diet because a keto diet is the most extreme of low-carb diets. It's mainly fat and meat. Plant foods are heavily restricted, whereas a paleo diet is the least extreme of the low-carb diets. It allows a much more liberal intake of plant foods, about five times more than a keto diet. So it has more of the protective nutrients that we need to protect our health, like, like fiber and phytochemicals and antioxidants and pre and probiotics and plant sterols and all of those things. It's about five times higher in a paleo than, than keto diet. So let's dig a little deeper into each of these diets. So we'll begin with the keto diet. So the common claims are that it will reduce epileptic seizures, that it will induce rapid weight loss, that it will improve brain function, it will fight cancer, it will improve endurance performance, it will reverse diabetes, it will reverse heart disease or reduce heart disease risk, and it will increase longevity. So we'll take a look at these. Are there any, first of all, is there any truth to the claims? Well, yes, there's some truth to the claims, but to varying degrees. So we'll examine the weight of the evidence fairly briefly. First, there's convincing evidence that ketogenic diets work for epilepsy. And the evidence is this. It is, first of all, there's probably 20% or so of children who are epileptic who do not respond to the very powerful epileptic seizure medications. And in these children, they seem to respond to a ketogenic diet, they actually over 50, they, we see an over 50% reduction in seizures in about half of those who do the diet, and about 10 to 15% of the children become completely seizure-free when they go on a ketogenic diet. Now, this seems to happen most if the children have um, an epileptic syndrome, such as something called GLUT1 deficiency, and GLUT1 deficiency is a rare genetic mutation that results in insufficient production of a glucose transport protein called GLUT1. So in other words, these children can't transport the glucose into the brain to be used for fuel. And so when all of a sudden they can use ketones, the brain can function again, and it stops the or slows the seizures. So you can see a, a therapeutic value in, in that for, for this particular uh, population. So switching to this alternative fuel can be very uh, life-saving for these children. So we have moderate evidence for weight loss. And, and basically, the evidence is mainly short-term. There are many reports in the literature of significant weight loss in trials of three weeks to four months on a ketogenic diet. We see favorable changes in body composition and markers of inflammation on this diet. So the evidence long-term is a little bit different. In 2013, 
There was a meta-analysis of 13 randomized controlled trials, and people on the keto diet actually did lose slightly more weight than people on a low fat or under 30% of calories from fat diet. They lost about uh, two pounds more over a year. Uh, they had lower triglycerides, they had higher a uh, LDL and HDL cholesterols, and they had no differences in uh, blood pressure, fasting, glucose, insulin, A1C, or C-reactive protein. And these are mainly measures of, uh, of our blood glucose regulation and, and our inflammation. Uh, however, weight loss was similar to the low fat after two years, so there were really no detectable differences. Now, there was actually an interesting metabolic ward study in 2016. You know what a metabolic ward study is? It's a study where people are actually kept in the hospital, and so what they eat is really controlled. They can't sneak anything extra. They get what you feed them, period. And, uh, and this was 17 overweight men were put on a, um, a, either a baseline, they were put on a baseline diet, and then I think it was um, uh, one of these where they do the, the baseline, and then, and then go to the keto diet. And, and so the body fat loss was no greater on the keto than it was on the 50% carbohydrate diet. But this was what was most important, is they actually lost more fat-free uh, mass uh, with the keto diet, which fat-free mass is what? It's muscle, exactly. So you don't want to lose muscle. So that was the disadvantage of the keto over the... Um, over the 50% the carbohydrate. The take-home message here is keto diets do promote weight loss and actually appear more effective than many other diets for accelerating weight loss short term. However, they don't really seem to offer very significant weight loss advantages over other diets long term, and they have some serious downsides. And we'll be talking about the downsides in a minute, but I just wanna make this point. There are lots of ways to lose weight. Anything that promotes an energy deficit will promote weight loss. You could eat 800 calories worth of Twinkies and lose weight. You could go on, um, you know, you could smoke cigarettes and lose weight. You could go on chemotherapy and lose weight. This was back in the 1920s. There was a huge campaign uh, for, um, sorry, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. There was a, uh-oh. There was a huge campaign for um, uh, using cigarettes for maintaining your slim figure. You know, just because something promote, promotes weight loss doesn't mean it's a good idea. So we need to remember that. And this, I think, is really important. Uh, every year, uh, US News ranks the best diets every single year, and they, they do that with a panel of the leading experts on uh, health and weight loss. And, and in the 2018 rankings, out of 40 diets, in the best diets overall category, keto diets tied for last place. In the best diets for healthy eating, keto diets ranked number 40 out of 40. They were in the very last place. Why? Well, because the diet is extremely high in total and saturated fat, and it's very high in fatty animal products, which will increase risk of disease. It has a high potential for nutritional deficiencies, deficiencies of fiber and potassium and folate and magnesium and vitamin C. And it has multiple adverse side effects. And so it ranked number 40. It's not a diet that we should be promoting or people should be following. There's a limited or mixed evidence for brain disorders, cancer, and diabetes. So the evidence in terms of brain function for Alzheimer's, there are possible benefits for people who are ApoE4 allele negative. So you know this particular ApoE4 increases your risk for Alzheimer's. So for people that don't have that, um, have that particular uh, problem, uh, they seem to respond better to ketogenic diets than people who have uh, ApoE4. And then for cognitive function, we've seen some benefits in a few animal studies. 
For migraines, there was a couple of case reports, one observational study suggesting benefit. Uh, there was one study suggesting improvement in motor and non-motor symptoms in, in Parkinson's disease. So very, very limited amount of research, nothing uh, very convincing as of yet. Uh, for cancer, the theory for cancer is that sugar feeds cancer. And so cancer cells can't use fat. So a keto diet will cause apoptosis or cell death in cancer cells. So that's the theory. So let's take a look at the evidence in favor of this theory. So there was a pilot study in 16 humans in 2011 that reported some improvement in the quality of life and blood parameters, but no increase in longevity in cancer patients. There were a few rat studies in 2012, 2013 that showed rats with human brain cancer that, that they had been given um, achieved remission or greater longevity with a, a keto diet. There was a human study, based, I think based on the findings of the rat study, that uh, used a keto diet and they found it improved the effectiveness of a chemo drug for glioblastoma, which is a type of brain cancer. But people who just used the keto diet and did not use the drug did not um, have any benefit. Uh, and then in 2015, there was a review of 32 case studies, and the keto diet prolonged remissions, but only one patient used just the keto diet. So that's, that's the evidence pro. The evidence con, uh, 2017, um, people with this genetic mutation called BRAF-V600E, um, they found that that a keto diet actually allows, um, or, or this particular mutation allows cancer cells to use ketones to grow faster. And, and so the mutation is actually present in 100% of hairy cell leukemias, 50% of melanomas, and about 10% of colon cancers and 5% of multiple melanomas, so or sorry, multiple myelomas. And so this is um, very interesting because in these particular cases, ketones accelerate the growth of the cancer. So that was 2017. And then in 2018, there was a study that showed that the keto diet plus chemo slowed tumor growth in mice better than the drug alone, but the keto diet alone actually accelerated the progression of the cancer. So that was a, just a brand new study. And then another new study from 2018 showed that slow dividing brain cancer cells are actually fueled by fat, not glucose. These cells are more invasive, more resistant to chemo and radiation than the fast dividing cells. So when they're fueled by fat, that's bad news because they're less responsive. So and then there, were some, there was some further evidence in 2018, there was a comprehensive review of keto diets and cancer and they reported that studies failed to show increased survival in advanced cancer patients with a keto diet. They also reported not all tumors respond favorably to keto diets. But they also reported that keto diets may have potential if combined with keto in early stages of the disease. Um, but if we look at low carb diets and cancer mortality, there was a 2018 study that reported that people who ate the most low carb diets had, or the, the lowest carb diets, had a 35% increased risk of dying of cancer compared to eat people eating the most carbohydrates. And cancer rates are lowest in people eating plant-based, as we talked about yesterday. So, and diabetes, the evidence is that there's some short-term benefits with keto diets, weight loss, improved glucose control, reduced A1C, lower triglycerides, fewer medications. But the downside is this, keto diets do not reverse insulin resistance. 
So if you have, you're on a keto diet, you get reductions in glucose and weight and all of that, and it looks like your insulin resistance is reduced, so you have a load of carbohydrate, um, the load of carbohydrate, you get this huge spike in glucose because you remain so insulin resistant. Long term, there are no long term studies using keto to treat diabetes in humans, but we have a lot of low carb studies and they consistently show favorable short term, less favorable long term results. We have a systematic review of studies uh, that are over 12 weeks uh, in length, and there were really no differences in weight loss or A1Cs with, with the longer term treatment. But there are a number of red flags, and unfortunately, we don't have long-term studies in humans, or they're quite rare. We have very few of them. But, but the red flags are that we found that ketogenic diets are associated with fatty liver, systemic glucose intolerance, insulin resistance, insufficient insulin secretion, reduced beta and alpha cell mass, dyslipemia, and inflammation. And as I mentioned, although human studies are fairly limited. And the contrary evidence is for athletic performance, heart disease, and longevity. And for athletic performance, the claims are big that it will improve your athletic performance. But we only have about seven studies. They were done between 2014 and 2018. And between five and 42 participants each, so they're pretty small. Duration, about four days to 10 weeks. And despite consistent fat loss in the athletes, most studies reported reduced performance, not better performance. And you can just see the summary here. Um, this uh, uh, first 2018 study, um, reduced performance, lower peak performance, lower mean power, less recovery. Uh, this one didn't find any change from 2018. And then uh, reduced performance, reduced, reduced. This one showed um, improved performance. This one showed a little bit of both improved with moderate intensity, but worsened with high intensity. And the bottom line, I think, really is, is that these diets fail because carbohydrates require less oxygen to power muscles than fats. The faster you move, the more carbohydrates muscles burn. And so when you're working at high speed and high intensity, you can't exercise as fast when, because your energy needs or your oxygen needs are increased and you need the carbohydrates for that. So what about heart disease? Well, the evidence for heart disease, we had a couple of early studies and in these studies, basically showing that keto diets increase total LDL and HDL cholesterol, but they decrease triglycerides. Uh, the 2006 study also reported uh, improved particle size. We have three meta-analysis looking at low carb versus low fat. And when I say low fat, it's almost always just under 30%. So it's not really low fat, but it's, it's you know, what, what they label low fat. So in 2012, 23 studies. In 2013, 32 studies. In 2016, 11 studies. And the findings were very consistent that low fat diets lower total and LDL cholesterol and high fat diets lower triglycerides and increase HDL and increase total and LDL cholesterol. And in children with epilepsy, the findings are very interesting. Several studies between 2015 and 2017 finding that keto diets consistently promoted negative changes in lipid profile and particle size, increasing, you know, they're just atherogenic diets. And, and so what they reported was increased total and LDL cholesterol, increased triglycerides, increased uh, oxidative stress, unfavorable changes in particle size. So all negative findings. And then if we look at cardiovascular disease and low low carbohydrate diets in general, the findings are so consistent. When we have a low carbohydrate diet that's mainly animal food diet, and this study in 2010, it increased mortality 14%. If the um, protein came from plants, it actually reduced mortality 23%. And then this study in 2012, the lowest carbohydrate eaters had a 60% increase in mortality. 
So that's huge. They actually quantified the increase. For every 20 grams of carbohydrate you eliminate from your diet, and for every five grams of protein you add to your diet, you increase risk of cardiovascular disease by 5%. That's incredible. And then in 2014, um, this study showed, uh, this is a US study, and they showed that a low carb, high animal protein diet increased risk by 51%, and that's mortality risk. The low carbohydrate plant diet, there was no association with increased mortality. So the uh, last is, is longevity, and the evidence in favor of longevity is just two 2017 studies that reported increased midlife longevity using ketogenic diets in mice. It improved their memory and health span, their, their, their strength and speed, and all of that. Uh, and, and so what we have no human studies. So when they say that it helps with longevity, the studies are very limited, and they're not based on humans. But we do have some strong studies on longevity and low-carbohydrate diets in people. In, and this is, these aren't randomized control trials, but these are studies that we've been following people for a long time. People eating the low-carb animal diets, it increased mortality 23%, and, and uh, with low-carb plant, it reduced mortality 20%. And in, um, in 2014, low-carb animal diet increased mortality 33%. And then the newest study, the, the 2018 study, the lowest carbohydrate intake was associated with a 32% increase in mortality risk. The last ones I was talking about were cardiovascular disease mortality, and I don't know if I made that clear. So this is total overall mortality. This study was really interesting because, again, if you look at it, uh, this is a graph showing the link between carbohydrate intake and mortality. And you can see the highest mortality is with consistently with the lowest carbohydrate intake. And then you see the lowest mortality at around 50 to 55% of carbohydrates. And then you see mortality going up again. And so you think, what is with that? Because this is, you know, diets that are fairly low-fat plant-based diets, they're like 75 or 80% carbohydrate because they're about 10% protein and about 10% fat, right? So why are we seeing this? Well, actually, the, the low carbohydrate intake, what we saw was a 32% increased mortality. With high carbohydrate intake, we saw 23% increased mortality. So not as much as the low carbohydrate diet. Um, the lowest risk, as I mentioned, 50 to 55%. And this part here, mortality increased 18% when the carbohydrate was exchanged for animal-derived fat or protein, and it decreased by 18% when the substitutions were plant-based. But here's why they think the association with the high-carbohydrate intake was. It's because high-carbohydrate diets in, that, in these studies were associated with refined carbohydrates. So the populations were mainly people eating white flour and white rice, and they thought they wouldn't have seen that increase if the carbohydrates were actually coming from whole foods. So the authors concluded, these data provide further evidence that animal-based low-carbohydrate diets, which are more prevalent in North American and European populations, should be discouraged. So then we have to say, how much carbohydrates do the world's healthiest people eat? The people who live the longest lives, like the people of the blue zones, who live to be 100 and are still productive, um, what, do, what do they eat to be able to achieve that kind of longevity? Well, actually, their carbohydrate intakes, sorry, I shouldn't have switched that so fast, their carbohydrate intakes, you can see range from about 40% to over 80%, but they average about 62%. Can you see the difference here? Here's the longest, healthiest people on the planet. Here's what their diet looks like. About 25% fat, about 12% protein, and about 62% carbohydrate. This looks very different than ketogenic or paleo diets, right? Or at least what people call paleo diets. 
So if we look at the Smeni in Bolivia and South America, these are the people that live a sort of a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. They have the lowest reported rates of chronic disease of any population on the planet. What is their diet? It's 14% protein, 14% fat, and 72% carbohydrate. So the verdict is, I think, can be summed up fairly well with this quote from Michael Pollan. Eat food, mostly plants, not too much. That's the key to longevity. So in summary, keto benefits are reduction in epileptic seizures, decreased energy intakes, weight loss, improved blood sugar, decreased triglycerides, increased HDL. The risks short term, increased LDL cholesterol, impaired glucose tolerance, worsening kidney function, reduced, reduced athletic performance, bone loss, vitamin and mineral deficiencies, constipation, weakness, fatigue, bad breath, and muscle cramps, the, and headaches. And in the short term, in the long term, increased all-cause mortality, increased exposure to pers persistent organic pollutants that induce metabolic disorders and increase birth defects. Persistent organic pollutants are things like dioxins and PCBs because they move up the food chain impaired artery function, increased total and in LDL cholesterol, kidney stones, nutritional deficiencies, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and hepatic steatosis, which is worse than non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So now let's dig a little deeper into paleo diets. So the claims are, this came from a paleo website, when people start eating paleo, they often lose weight, feel less hungry, and have fewer cravings for sugar. Their skin clears up, they have more energy, and they find that muscles start appearing where they had been flabbed for years. This way of eating can literally reverse diabetes, reduce your chances of getting cancer, and reduce inflammation in your joints. It can help you avoid heart disease. The theory, of course, is what humans ate in pre-agricultural times is really what's best suited to our genetic makeup. And as with on other animals, the diet we would eat in the wild is really the diet we were intended to eat. And so, you know, what, what we know is that our native diet supported early humans through a two to four decade life. People lived an average of 20 to 40 years. Regardless of that, let's assume that it is a good idea to eat like our ancestors. What's the first question you would want to ask? What did our ancestors eat, right? That's the first question we need to ask. Pre-agricultural people ate wild plants, animals, fish, and insects. The balance of those foods varied with the time frame during the Paleolithic period, with the location on the planet these people were at, with the season, with gathering and hunting skills, with tool, with, with, with tools and culture. And there were changes over time during the first 80% of the Paleolithic period. Humans were vegetarian because we didn't have any ability to hunt. We might, might have eaten some insects, but that was about it. During the last 20 years, humans started to hunt. And, and so some meat was added to the diet. So what didn't people in the Paleolithic period eat? Well, they didn't eat any packaged foods. There was nothing from a box or a bag. There were no deep fried foods, there were no fast foods, there were no refined fats, oil, sugar, or salt. There, were, there, there was no added salt, I should say. There, were, there, there was no milk of other mammals or products that were made from the milk of other mammals. There was certainly no uh, bacon, ham, salami, sausage, or any other processed meat, and there was no alcohol. So do new paleo diets equal true paleolithic diets? And this is a question I asked myself. And I'll tell you what, what really got me interested in looking at this question. I went to the nutritional anthropology research, and I found two studies, one from 1997 and one from 2010. And these studies are the best studies we have that estimate the intakes of Paleolithic man. So they did a, the, the first study in 97, and then 25 years later, their second study came out. 
And basically what they said is early ancestral diets were overwhelmingly plant-based with some insects and very small amounts of animal flesh. Reliance on meat increased in later ancestral diets as hunting skills improved. However, much proof points to continued significant, if not predominant dependence on plant foods. So here we have, this is the DRI, so this is our recommended intake for macronutrients. This is the Paleolithic um, estimates of what people actually ate in Paleolithic times from 97. And this is their revised um, estimates from 2010. And so what we know is people probably ate about 3,000 calories. They got a, close to 30% of their calories from protein. And this is the later part of the Paleolithic, that last 20% of the Paleolithic period. Carbohydrates range from probably about 35 to 65% of calories. 35% for the hunters very far north who had limited plants. 65% for people closer to the equator. Fat ranged from probably 20 to 35% of calories. Saturated fat, somewhere 6 to 12% of calories, depending on how much meat they were having. Cholesterol, around the 500 milligrams. Omega-6 to omega-3, around the 2 to 1. And fiber, around the 100 to 100, around 70 to 150 grams. So when you look at all of that, is there anything there that just pops out at the page at you? The fiber, it's absolutely crazy. 104, that was the original estimate. And then they, you know, they increased the range from 70 for the hunters way far north to 150 to 200 in the people near the equator. So where does fiber come from? Plants, exactly. So when I saw this, I thought to myself, holy smokes, these people were eating a truckload of plants. So I don't see people eating a paleo, so-called paleo diet today, that are eating anywhere close to 70 to 150 grams of fiber. Even vegans don't eat, you know, often, a, you know, they might get 70 if they're eating a really good vegan diet. But even most vegans don't get that. So then I looked at the micronutrients, and again, the estimates really were shocking. So vitamin C to five to 600 milligrams. Most vegans probably get two or 300. Where does vitamin C come from? Yeah, fruits, vegetables, exactly. That's where vitamin C comes from. What about calcium? One to 2,000 milligrams. They weren't drinking any milk. Where did they get their calcium? Leafy greens. You know, plants. Potassium, seven to 10,000 milligrams. What's the recommended intake of potassium? 4,700. Does anybody meet it? Probably 90, 95% of the population doesn't get that much potassium. And vegans do the best, but even vegans often don't get the 4,700. These guys were eating close to 10,000. Where does potassium come from? Plants, right? So then I thought to myself, I wonder what is closer to a true paleolithic diet, a paleo diet or a vegan diet? So I thought, I'm just gonna do some math here. So I went to a paleo, the probably the most popular paleo website and took three days of recommended menus and analyzed them to see what they were actually eating. And then I did the same with a recommended plant-based menu, which is 100% plant-based or vegan. And then I compared the amount of nutrients, this is the macronutrients in the true paleo diet, with those of what people who are calling themselves paleo are actually eating, with those people on a plant-based diet were eating. To look at, I wonder what comes closer, the vegan diet or the 100% plant-based or this thing they call a paleo diet. And here's what I found out. And, and of course, when I did the analysis, I adjusted the menus so they all provided the same number of calories. So it was a fair comparison. So they all provided 3,000 calories. 
So the protein was actually closer on the new paleo diet, about 30%, 32% of calories on this, what they call the paleo diet, very close, whereas a vegan diet's only about 15%. But carbohydrates were much closer on the plant-based diet. Uh, fat was closer on the plant-based diet. Saturated fat was closer on the plant-based diet. Cholesterol was closer on the new paleo diet. The ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 was actually closer on the plant-based diet. And of course, the fiber intake was closer on the plant-based diet. And, and the, you know, you see the 31 grams of fiber in the new paleo diet, but that's at 3,000 calories. So at 2,000 calories, like most people would be eating, they might get 20 if they're doing a good diet. So then let's look at the micronutrients. Who comes closer? Well, for riboflavin, thiamine, vitamin C, and E, the plant-based diet came closer. Vitamin A and zinc, the paleo diet came closer. Iron, calcium, sodium, and potassium, the plant-based diet came closer. And here's the summary. The paleo diet comes closer to a true paleolithic diet for four nutrients, protein, cholesterol, zinc, and vitamin A. The plant-based diet comes closer to a true paleolithic diet for 13 nutrients. And you can see them listed there. In other words, a plant-based, 100% plant-based diet is actually nutritionally closer to a true paleolithic diet than what people are calling a paleolithic diet or a paleo diet today. So why the macronutrient discrepancies? If you think to yourself, the paleo people are eating meat and plants like vegetables. And, and that's what people ate in paleolithic times. Why aren't the numbers matching better for nutrient intakes. Well, let's look at what the differences were. First of all, total fat, they eat twice as much fat as people during the Paleolithic period. They eat two to three times more saturated fat and two and a half times more cholesterol. They eat only about a quarter to a half the carbohydrates, and they eat only about a third of the fiber. So what's going on? Well, why the discrepancy? Well, the paleo today, the people trying to do paleo, are focused on achieving the protein intakes of the Paleolithic period, 30% protein. That's what their focus is, getting that protein. They're less concerned about getting the same amount of fiber or vitamin C or potassium as people during the Paleolithic period did. So their emphasis is on meat as opposed to plant foods. And we have to recognize that wild foods do not equal farmed foods. Meat and vegetables consumed today were, you know, were not available in Paleolithic times, and they bear little resemblance to those eaten by pre-agricultural populations. If we compare wild meat to domestic meat, what we see is meat from wild animals is much lower in fat, about 6 to 16% of calories from fat, compared to 30 to 60% of calories from fat in farmed animals. It was much lower in saturated fat, higher in omega-3s. It was free of antibiotics, of added hormones, and in Paleolithic times, of environmental contaminants. And even the wild versus domestic plants, cultivated vegetables and fruits have been bred for appearance, palatability, transportability, digestibility, and yield. Wild plants deliver over three times the fiber of commercial plants and are more concentrated in vitamins and minerals and protein. So there were big differences. So the paleo diet of today does not equal the true paleolithic diet. And what about the claims about reduced disease risk? Because we have all sorts of little trials that show reduced body weight, increased satiety, improved lipid profiles, improved blood glucose, better insulin sensitivity, less inflammation, decreased blood pressure in people going paleo versus people eating Western-style diets. So why are we seeing these favorable results? Well, we're seeing the favorable results because the paleo diet of today removes refined grains, refined sugars, refined fats and oils, or they're supposed to, fast foods, fried foods, processed meats, high-fat dairy, and alcohol. That's what they remove in these studies. And so, of course, you're going to get some improvements compared to a Western diet. However, 
is it really short-term gain for long-term pain? And this is something I would argue. While many paleo diets do induce weight loss and favorable lab results in the short term, there are really significant concerns about adopting such diets in the long term. Paleo diets are high meat diets. That's what they are. They're high in animal protein, they're high in agrochemicals, they're high in carnitine, which is converted to TMAO by gut bacteria, which is highly atherogenic. They're high in endotoxins, which is the outer cell membrane of, of gram-negative bacteria that can cause, that can leak into the bloodstream and be very inflammatory. They're high in environmental contaminants, all the persistent organic pollutants. They're high in heme iron, which is a pro-oxidant. They're high in new 5 gc which is a pro-inflammatory molecule, and nitrosamines if they're processed. They're high in products of oxidation, they're high in saturated fat and cholesterol, and they cause an upregulation of cancer-promoting genes. So that's what we're doing when we boost meat intake. How much meat are people eating paleo actually consuming? Well, the typical recommendations are for 30% protein. So in a 2,000 calorie diet, that's 150 grams of protein. In a 2,800 calorie diet, it's 210 grams of protein. So assuming that 80% of their protein comes from meat and 20% from plants, we're talking about 16 to 22 ounces of meat a day. 16 to 22 ounces. How much meat is actually safe to eat? Well, according to the most cited nutrition expert in the world, Dr. Walter Willett from Harvard, if you step back and look at the data, the optimum amount of red meat you should eat, you eat should be zero. In 2016, the Mayo Clinic put out a study, um, a analysis of six studies, six studies with over three million participants. They said there was strong, consistent evidence that increased intake of red meat, especially processed red meat, is associated with increased all-cause mortality. And we see that in meta-analysis after meta-analysis. Red meat is consistently linked with all-cause mortality, with cardiovascular disease, with cancer, and with diabetes. And in 2015, the World Health Organization actually declared processed meat a group one human carcinogen, and red meat a group 2A, or probable human carcinogen. A group one human carcinogen is in the same category as cigarettes and asbestos. So this, we know. Um, so let's talk about plant-based versus paleo-keto diets briefly. We have very clear, consistent evidence that whole plant foods are protective to health. Heavily processed foods, fast foods, fried foods, with added fat, sugar, and salt are damaging to health, and meat, especially processed meat, increases risk of disease. We know that. And because we know that, national and international dietary guidelines are starting to reflect this reality. What you need to understand is these diets are taking out some of the most protective foods on the planet, foods that are consistently associated with disease risk reduction. And the evidence is so strong for that now that national and international dietary guidelines are starting to reflect this. The World Health Organization in the 12 Steps to Healthy Eating, step number one, is to eat a nutritious diet based on a variety of foods originating mainly from plants rather than from animals. Number one, the FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization, in plates, pyramids, and planets, they, they highlighted international leaders that are, large, that are promoting largely plant-based diets because they have advantages for health and the planet. In Germany, choose mostly plant-based foods. In Brazil, Eat foods mainly of plant origin in Qatar. Emphasize a plant-based diet. In the UK, eat more plant-based foods. We're seeing this over and over and over again. Cancer organization, eat a healthy diet. This is the American Cancer Society with an emphasis on plant foods. And, and the World Cancer Research Fund, eat mostly foods of plant origin. The American Institute of Cancer Research, choose mostly plant foods such as vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and cut sugary drinks. If we look at the Dietary Guidelines for American Scientific Advisory Committee in 2015, 
They say that a dietary pattern that is higher in plant-based foods, such as vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds, and lower in animal-based foods is more health-promoting and is associated with um, lesser environmental impact than the current US diet. Then we see this brand new Eat Lancet Commission from 2019, and they basically say universal healthy reference diet is one that increases um, fruits, vegetables, or vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds, and decreases unhealthy foods like red meat, sugar, and refined grains. So this is universal, and now in Canada, I'm, for, I'm a Canadian, and I was rejoicing, um, very recently we put out our new food guide. And our new food guide is reflecting this knowledge as well. We did not listen or allow input from industry on this food guide. And so the guide is mostly plants. Half the plate vegetables and fruits, a quarter of the plate whole grains, a quarter of the plate your protein sources, whether that be beans, nuts and seeds, or some animal products. Dairy is nowhere to be seen except for as part of the protein group. So now, summing up, let's talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly of low-carb diets. First of all, the good. Low-carb diets tend to eliminate refined carbohydrates, the white flour products and the sugars like soda. They eliminate many highly processed foods which are damaging to health. That's good. The bad? They're high in fat, saturated fat, and cholesterol. They're high in pro-oxidants and chemical contaminants. They're low in fiber, phytochemicals, and antioxidants. They have many potential nutrition shortfalls, especially with a keto diet, like minerals and uh, vitamins. And the ugly. Well, low-carbohydrate diets are high animal food diets. They are both ecologically unsustainable and ethically unjustifiable. So let's talk about ecological sustainability. Low-carb diets essentially downplay the ecological crisis that makes eating lower on the food chain an ecological imperative. If our entire population ate a low-carb diet, our planet's dwindling resources would very quickly run dry. David Katz estimated that if we all ate paleo, we would need 15 planet Earths to sustain the current population with the amount of meat that would be required. In 2016, a study from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences estimated that if green, by 2050, Greenhouse gas, gas emissions would be reduced by 29% if everybody followed the global dietary guidelines to eat more fruits and vegetables and eat less meat, sugar, and calories. They would be reduced by 70% if we all ate a vegan diet. Their recommendation, a global shift to a plant-based diet. There was another study that I thought was kind of interesting that showed a typical steak and shrimp cocktail dinner would burden the atmosphere with 816 kilograms of carbon dioxide emissions. This is the same as what would be produced by driving a relatively fuel-efficient automobile from LA to New York City. And finally, I want to end on this note. Um, we need to, as human beings, think about the consequences of our food choices beyond ourselves. We need to think about the consequences for our fragile planet, but we have got a responsibility to also think about the ethical consequences of our choices. You know, when we think about it in terms of people, if everyone ate plant-based, the global calorie supply would be increased by an estimated 50%, which could effectively wipe out hunger. And for animals, that's the thing that we often don't talk about. And it, to me, makes no sense for us to cause incredible pain, suffering, and death in other living beings when it is not only unnecessary, we're destroying our own health and the health of the planet in the process. We slaughter 70 
billion animals every year for food. Most of those animals are raised in CAFOs, or confined animal feeding operations. Probably in the United States, it's close to 90% of them. Now, I don't know about you, this isn't including anything from the ocean. Nothing from the ocean at all. So this is just land animals. 70 billion is almost 10 times the human population every single year. We raise and slaughter for our food. And you know, I'm not sure how we make the distinction, but when you think about, is it intelligence? How do we pick the animals that are gonna be our food? You know, if we think about dogs and cats, most people are repulsed by the thought of eating them. But in fact, pigs are smarter than dogs. So it's not intelligence. Pigs are, the estimated intelligence of a pig is, is about a three-year-old uh, child. I remember studies being done in California that, that were looking at the pig's ability to play a game on a computer where they used their snout to move a joystick. And they said pigs, they, they couldn't teach dogs to play that game. And they said the pigs could actually, could actually not only play the game, but they never made a mistake. What they had to do was match two things on each side of the computer. And if they got it right, they got a treat. And they said no pig ever made a mistake. They said they tried to train a chimpanzee to do it. And, and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the researcher actually looked at the chimpanzee and said, if you were a pig, you would have had this by now. So these are very, very intelligent animals that would live, what, 12 to 15 years? They live six months in hell. They live six months in, in these little stalls that are so small they can hardly move. The, the dust and dander in the place, the smell is so reprehensible that we have to wear a gas mask to go inside. Their smellers are 200 times more sensitive than ours. They go crazy in these places. So they sometimes chew one another's tails off because they're going insane. And what, so what do we do to prevent that? We just, we cut their ears off, we dock their tails, we remove their genitals with no anesthetic when they're about three weeks old. And, and all of this so we can eat them when they're about six months of age. And they get transported to slaughterhouses and it's estimated that 10 to 30% are inappropriately stunned and are actually skinned and boiled alive. These creatures are smarter than dogs. You know, how do we as human beings justify this? I don't get it. It's, you know, it, I think the only way that we justify it is we put a halo on it because it's tradition. You know, think about the things that we've justified under the banner of tradition for so many centuries that have been so wrong. And we have to stand up and be counted. When tradition is wrong, we need to change it. It's up to us. And so we need to be leaders in this regard. This is so important. The ultimate question is this. How can humans best adapt to their current environment to sustain a growing population on a shrinking planet? We as human beings have a choice. When we consider the consequences of our food choice, not just for ourselves, but beyond ourselves, a plant-based diet becomes an ecological and an ethical imperative. And I think this sums it up as well as anything. The keys to a long life. Avoid fatty meats, eat your veggies, and get your daily exercise. <laughs> and with that, I'll end. These are some of my books. My most recent one is actually um, the Kick Diabetes Cookbook. And because I have a minute, I'll just tell you I'm in the midst of a sequel to that book that's more an information, a larger uh, book with a lot of information, fewer recipes but about um, overcoming diabetes. And, um, and I will end with that, just a very quick mention of a, a program I'm teaching at Living Light as well. So this is a more intensive um, uh, nutrition program. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.
Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, I'm very happy to take questions, of course. Rita. That you are crown of crowns. Fabulous slides. You have left not for a chance. And as my colleague, I want to share this with you. Excellent slides. Thank you. Thank you very much. That means a lot to me coming from you, Rita, who's a, not only a colleague, but a fellow of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And I'm honored that you're here. And thank you so much for those kind words. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've been watching you on uh, YouTube for about 15 months. I went plant-based 15 months ago. And uh, the movie What the Health Got Me. But uh, thank you for what you do. Uh, what do you say to somebody that says, oh, everything in moderation? What do you say to them? <laughs> uh, thank you for that question. You know, what I say to people who say everything in moderation is everything in moderation is, is reasonable if, if everything you're eating is relatively healthy. But everything in moderation, if you're eating things that are all killing you, will still kill you, just a little more slowly. Uh, you know, it's, it's um, it, you know, I can remember, and I, um, meaning no disrespect, but for years our national nutrition campaigns were built around the moderation message. You know, all foods can fit into a healthy diet. There are no good foods, no bad foods, everything in moderation. And, and I remember thinking to myself, here we are, dying, 70% of us are dying of a chronic disease, and we're trying to, you know, tell people that, oh, deep fried pork rinds are just fine, just so long as you eat them in moderation. That was not the, me it's not the message people need to hear. The message people need to hear is eat more vegetables, eat more whole grains, eat more, you know, eat healthy foods, eat less deep fried foods, eat less meat. Those are the messages people need to hear. We need to be very careful of the moderation message. Even though moderation generally makes sense in your life, if most of what you do is killing you, it will still, moderation will still kill you. So um, I wanted to ask you about fasting because from um, your data, it seems that it's beneficial. So I was wondering, because I know that um, intermittent fasting is very big, it's probably just as big in the workout community as keto and paleo. So what are your feelings? I know that like intermittent fasting in the gyms, they always talk about like um, you could, you know, do it. Because you said the benefits, if you stayed on a fast for like three days, you could get cell renewal, and so what are your feelings in terms of maybe doing a three day a week water fast and then eating a you know, vegetarian based diet for the balance of the week? So four three, as they would say in the gym. Yeah, there's a four three, there's the five two, there's a six one, there's all kinds of ways of doing these intermittent fasts. Some people even do them where you're only fasting for a certain number of hours each day, so 12 or 14 or 16 hours, something like that, and these have become quite popular. And I think, you know, generally, do what works for you, what feels, you know, I mean, we need to have some science base, but generally the evidence is fairly strong that sort of fasting or fasting mimicking diets could be of benefit, especially for people who are over-consuming. It reduces your level of consumption. 
And so whatever helps you to reduce your level of consumption may be of some value. Now, the thing that I would be concerned about is, uh, is simply doing extended water fasting, because there are a lot of risks to water fasting. And I would prefer if somebody was doing water fasting that they do it under the supervision of a, a, a place like True North, for, for example. Um, I think maybe what would be a reasonable compromise would be to do a juice fast or um, something where you're just limiting your calories pretty significantly, big salads, that kind of thing, and doing a, what they call a fasting mimicking diet, which is low calorie, or just doing the overnight, or maybe something not quite as three, four, but maybe five, two, and on those two, do some green juices. Because what I'd like to see is I'd like to see your body loaded up with antioxidants during that time of reduced food intake. So you just be giving yourself quite an antioxidant boost. You also have to be a little conscious of preserving your muscle mass. And so I think to do something that's a little more modified would be a reasonable compromise. But definitely some, uh, some significant therapeutic advantages to using those kinds of diets. For diabetes, for example, they can be quite powerful. Yes. Just one quickly, uh, I don't really know what this 4252 and all that is, but the, the general criticism I've heard about uh, fasting by a, a, a doctor is that um, it's misguided because you need nutrients to drive the phase one, phase two detox in the liver. And if you don't have it, in fasting, the body tends to uh, sequester those, so they're not available for the liver detox. Yeah, so the concern is, well, what about all the nutrients you need to detoxify the body? And that's one of the reasons why I think, especially if you're doing it on your own, that you do some of the juicing to provide, uh, or at least something to provide those nutrients, especially if you're, you know, incorporating sprouts and such in your juices, you'll absolutely boost those kinds of phytochemicals that are really important for the detoxification pathways. But also... Um, uh, I think with pure fasting, with water fast, I think the evidence, and Dr. Furman is a, quite an expert in this area as well. He's speaking later today, so you may want to ask him as well. But um, we have some studies that are, are, show some very powerful therapeutic healing with fasting. And, and so, but my, my feeling is it does, when it's used, you need to be really monitoring uh, your blood levels of everything to make sure that your body can can handle it and that you go off the fast if your body's not responding well. But I've seen some some really dramatic um, improvements in in people's health with fasting from a place like True North. Um, that's where you do four days of eating, three days of fasting, or the five two is five days of eating, two days of fasting. Some people don't completely fast, they just do a very low calorie diet or a juice fast during those two days, exactly. Oh, I guess I'm sorry we have to end, but I'm gonna be outside doing signing books and I'm very happy to answer any questions out there.